as John mentioned, I put this class on dozens of times, both nationally, regionally, and here at the farm. It makes sense to me because my background is I went to college to be a nurse and I was a critical care nurse before computers. So everything had its place within a multi um, sectioned chart, which you're going to see as we go through this. And when we got alpacas, we invited our first veterinarian here at the end of one day and we said, just come meet us and see our alpacas and, you know, ask us any questions and we'll have a better understanding of how you operate. And she came to the ranch and said, well, what about this animal? And I said, well, she's pregnant and she's going to have a baby next summer. And the vet looked at me and said, when, when was she bred? And I said, I don't know, but I could, it's in this file somewhere. Then we went to the next animal and she said, when was this one last vaccinated? And I said, I don't know. And I grabbed another file and I'm looking through different paperwork from a different farm where we bought a different animal from. And this veterinarian looked at me and she shook her finger and she said, it's your job to know. And it's one thing that you don't do to a critical care nurse is shake your finger and tell me it's my job to know. I had to figure out a system so that I would never be embarrassed like that before so that I could keep multifaceted information about many, many, many animals at a fingertip so that I could talk intelligently to my veterinarians when I had a problem with an animal. So that's how this all came about and and customers, and customers now too, so that when someone calls and talks about, you know, a breeding problem or a CREA problem or a birthing problem that, you know, we can be on the same page with what kind of information should we be collecting. It's a very simple manual system. I do a multi-classification file. It has two sections inside of it. And I go in the same order per section that we're going to show you now if, okay, I have my files broken up into these five sections. They're the same order all the time. And when John is talking to someone about selling an animal or breeding an animal, he knows what section to go to for the information that will all be in the file. It started out that I had- Before you do, I had, uh, I had mentioned this on our website about these files. I don't know if anybody saw that and um, got a link to it, but these, these are the classification folders. If you want to show what they are there? And there's how many sections to them? There's actually two sections on the inside. They're a little bit pricey. Um, they're like two dollars and fifty cents to three dollars a piece. But I find that it's very reassuring having these files. When we first started out with our first dozen animals or so, I just had a plastic rubber made bin that I kept all my files in and I was able to take the bin to the barn, lay the file out on a table, write on it when we did herd maintenance or when the CREA was being born or when the breeding was happening. And I didn't have to write it on a scrap piece of paper and then go into the house and re-enter it into a computer program. There's many herd ease and computer files out there that can help you with your records. But I found that the paperwork was easier for me to collect information and see the historical data. This is one of the animals we've had for many years. We have this year's information. 
last year's information, you go in descending order like you do with a medical record or a legal record so that I can go back to when we purchased this animal, or actually this animal was born here in 2008. I can go back to her birth records in this file. If the animal is sick or injured, I can take the entire file with me to our veterinarian and they might ask, well, did she have problems conceiving last time? Or did she have any problems birthing? Or any other health issues that might be impacting the situation? And it would be all in this file. I wouldn't have to grab a laptop and take it with me. Now, not all of my animals on the farm have the fancy schmancy two section in the middle. And we'll go through exactly what those are. Sometimes I just abbreviate it and go with the two sections. So if I have an animal coming to the farm just for breeding purposes, they get one of these files. And I keep information on all animals that come to our ranch in terms of their health records or past breeding records. You know, it makes my life easier. So the things that I keep track of on my um, health, on my um, files, I always have the first section, which is health records. The second section is always their reproduction records. Third section, purchase and registration, goes on to any show records or insurance. And the last section, fiber and EPDs. Now, today we're going to go in more depth into the health and reproduction records. Um, this form that you can see is something that we came up with. And the information, which is on the left-hand side of the page, can change. You can use these forms. You can change them, modify them make them your own because I know there are different health records down in the South in Alabama than there are here in Colorado. So you might have more deworming or anti-parasite information because of your climate and the parasite risks that you have in Alabama as opposed to Colorado. So you can change these things as you or your farm and veterinarian decide upon. So the different boxes are for the different months. If you go to the next one, you can see it's filled out with an animal name and the information. Do you need all the information that's on the top? No. Chances are all the animals are owned by you, but sometimes they're not. They may be boarded or they may be there for breeding purposes to your herd sire that's supposedly the real nice guy. But you want to know the basic information about the animal at a glance. The vaccination, the C, D, and T vaccination, you can see that I did herd maintenance in the month of March. The number in the top left corner of March square is 15. So on the 15th of March, this is, this is what I did. How can I blow it up? There you go. Okay. So for the C, D, and T, which we give once a year here in Colorado, I gave it on the 15th of March. I gave three cc's of the um, vaccination uh, drug, and I gave it in the right shoulder area subcutaneous in the right ear, right shoulder area. So that's what those abbreviations are. You and your vet can come up with what makes sense for you. Um, parasites, the parasite treatment, I also gave them Panicure, which is the capital P, Ivermectin, Dectromax, Frontline. Those are different anti-parasite medications, which what you can give. TX is the medical abbreviation for treatment. <laughs> um, we also had a problem years ago 
with ear ticks. They would come in on straw. They would come in on animals that were coming from other farms. So for a couple of years, we were treating for ear ticks and we were spraying either frontline, which is the FL for ear treatment, or P, which is for fipronil. And so depending upon what works for your farm, when we trim toenails, when we do um, dental checks, those are all the things that we look at and keep track of. You do not need to keep track of body score and weights as often as I did. In the very beginning, I weighed everybody on the farm at least once a month and body scored them once a month. I have now gotten comfortable doing that probably two or three times a year. More often, if I have a concern with an animal that might be thin or some of my older moms who are nursing a baby, the baby is growing, but the mom is losing weight. So I'll check her weight a little more often. Um, some of the other things that I do keep track of is when we have our veterinarian here to do ultrasounds. And that's very important to our farm. One of our goals is to have happy, healthy babies with the least amount of problems and the least amount of work. So I know when they were ultrasounded and I know how to calculate out, which I'll, I'll share with you how to calculate out their due range. And then if they're going to a different ranch and if they are, um, or, any other notes that or any other notes that might pertain to taking care of the animal. This animal was somebody that was just here for breeding. Okay. I think along with keeping track of the health, keeping track of the reproduction records, when you breed an animal, what is the frequency? What is the outcome? You have a blank copy of a reproductive record. Do I fill out everything, every single blank on the reproductive record? Usually not. <laughs> Um, I kind of cut to the chase down to the calendar on the bottom. I'll make it bigger. There. <laughs> this, again, is the calendar that we all use. A veterinarian will look at this and will look to see how often you bred a female, when you bred her, how many days after her last baby, how many days between behavior checks, all of this can go onto one sheet that a veterinarian will look at with you. A filled out one, there. <laughs> See, he shows me a new way and I go back to the old way. That's fine, whatever way works. The next slide shows you an example of a breeding that we did for Yvette. I have her name down at the bottom and the male's name at the bottom so that I can keep their records straight. Well, when you see your, your clipboard, you see how it works in the barn. And how that helps you. How Those that helps me. The abbreviations that we use are all written down at the bottom. P stands for parturition. That's when she had the day that she had her last baby. And her last baby was born on May 27th. We know that she is going to be receptive on approximately seven day increments after she gives birth. And that's a whole nother eight hour long class about good breeding schedule strategies for the highest optimal conception. We bred her back at, I believe that makes it approximately, I guess I'm 18 to 20 days. She did conceive because each time I checked her, she was non-receptive after her initial breeding. We called the seven-day check the you know little spit, if you will, where she will spit off the male 
if she has ovulated, but that doesn't necessarily mean she has conceived. The 14 day approximately uh, behavior check where she spits off or is non-receptive. We call that the big spit. And that means that she possibly has conceived. And then at approximately 21 days that we check her, we call that the real spit. After 21 days, I feel comfortable that she has an early conception and that I will begin to batch my females together so that when the veterinarian comes, he will ultrasound maybe a half dozen to 10 animals at a time. And you can see I have two positive ultrasounds after she um, has been non-receptive. Um, people need to realize that not every early conception is going to continue on through birthing. It is approximately 15 to 20% of early conceptions just go away. And it's like that for women as well as with animals. And it's the, the people who are sharing news about being pregnant when their EPT, you know, urine stick says they're pregnant at 11 days they might not want to share that information because 15 to 20 percent of those early conceptions just go away. Same thing with animals. That's why we do a couple of ultrasounds a couple of months apart so that we can be assured that the, the female is pregnant and that the pregnancy is continuing. The veterinarian who does the ultrasounds is also able to give us the benefit of their knowledge, saying things like, we have a heartbeat on the first ultrasound at a little over 30 days pregnant, and they know the size at the next ultrasound, and they can tell you, is the crea growing appropriately? And that helps us do our planning. Or we had one, a customer animal that was here for ultrasounding, where she was approximately four months pregnant, but the fetus was much, much smaller than a four-month embryo should be. And doctor, our, our veterinarian said, I'd like to re-ultrasound her in spring. She might be slipping or getting rid of her pregnancy. Yeah. So those are things that if you get into the breeding part of raising alpacas, you know, there are classes. We had a wonderful um, day-long neonatal class just last October, and we learned a lot about normal gestation, and we also had a wet lab on how to correct um, dystocia pregnancies where the fetus might be twisted or the head back or the leg back complications to know what you can fix and when you really need to get a veterinarian involved. Now on the back of the breeding sheet, I call that my cheat sheet. I have different notes as to um, the back of the reproduction sheet are my notes as it pertains to, there it is, as it pertains to that individual breeding. There. For some reason it's highlighted. Okay. Yeah, it's highlighted. There we go. Um, on the back are instructions that I have for how I um, evaluate the female. I know approximately the time we started breeding, did I wrap her tail? That's what TW, tail wrap and bottom washed. It's the nurse in me to make sure that things are clean down below. I know that it's day 28 since the Crea was born. I know that um, was she receptive or was she not? How long she bred for? 
And those are notes that I put on the back that may or may not mean something to the owner or may or may not be something that will carry over to her next breeding. But it, I'm not going to remember if I breed 20, 30, 50 animals a year, I am not going to remember individual animals. And so writing it down is my reassurance that I can retrieve that information when I need it. Um, in the old days before digital, we had actual film, ultrasound film that the veterinarian would print off on their ultrasound machine and I would tape it into the record where you could actually see the fetal development. So the reproduction records, the health records are things that are very important so that our farm runs smoothly. Okay, now we talked about the gestation table that we know when an animal breeds and the highest probability is 335 to 345 days is the highest probability of birth. So if we bred an animal on January 1st, she would be likely to deliver between December 2nd and de December 12th next year. We have found this to be accurate about half the time. Approximately 25% of the babies born here have been born either early and about 25% of the babies have been born after 345 days. So I like to tell people that the average gestation for an alpaca is 335 to 345 days plus or minus two weeks before and two weeks after. The shortest gestation that we've had here on our ranch is 312 days. And the longest that we've had here on our ranch is 376 days. And the reason I know that is I started keeping records, the first babies that were born here. And we've had over 400 born here now. And I can go back and I can tell you how many days gestation was um, Bianca and bred to Baron. 338 days. I can tell you when we had dystocias or problems. I can tell you when we um, had a problem where she slipped twins. So all of those things come into play if you plan to have babies. The birthing sheet that we use, I use it as a template. Again, do I fill out absolutely every square? No, but it gives me and it gives my husband and sometimes our farm helper a format, a roadmap to use what's important to pay attention to. Down below, you'll see that we have a lot of weights on the CREA. We check weights twice a day for the first week, once a day for week two and three. We make sure that the babies are growing because if they're not growing, they're either not getting milk or there's some problem or mom isn't manufacturing enough milk. So you have to step in and intervene. To keep myself clear and organized, I have a big calendar in the barn nailed to the wall. And that will tell me who I'm going to breed who they're being bred to, when is the optimal time to behavior check them after they've been bred at 7, 14 days, 21 day intervals. Down below, I have um, a clipboard with my birthing information. So my baby weights all get indicated. And I also have my repro records, my reproduction records, so that the breeding information is all in one place. It will help you to know which males are being used. If they're very popular, you don't want to use them more than twice a day for a couple of days, and then you want to give them a break. You know, so there's all kinds of things that 
you know, you can ascertain from the calendar. This is a blow up of the different names, who they were bred to, and the follow up that we did. Does it have to be on day number seven? If you're out of town on day number seven, you can do it on day six and day eight. You know, so it helps you kind of plan out what your week is going to look like and how you're going to use your meal. And I write down even, I didn't realize I wrote that down about rain and hail and snow on, on the 12th. And thunder. And thunder. Now, I'm going to give a prize to anybody who can identify whose butt that is in the picture because I'm done talking. One of the other things that I like to uh, remind people of that they need to keep track of is when they call a veterinarian. I have I have a, a notebook, and every year or so when I fill it up, I get a new one. But it will tell me when I call the vet. It will have my thoughts and questions organized so that I take up the least amount of the veterinarian's time. Mm -hmm. Because if you're paying a veterinarian by the hour, you're going to pay a lot more if your records aren't in place and if your thoughts aren't in order. And I can also go back and see from years past, I might remember that we had a tooth root abscess on a female but the treatment was something that I don't remember. I can go back in my notes and find out what we did and were we successful. So it's just having the historical information at your fingertips so you can use it when you need it. And I'm gonna be done talking. I'm oh. frustrated with uh, technology. I'm gonna to have to get better at that. Um, I will answer any yeah, questions. It'll yeah. <laughs> Any questions on what I put out there, what you saw? Um, how many have, have been doing breedings? Or I actually, do you have any method that you've been doing for keeping track of your health records? That's always a question. Because one thing and why I'm watching around on Facebook a lot, I'll see people, um, you know, posting, you know, what do I do to work for treatments of that? We yeah. run across that when we treated an animal for some issue three years ago. There's no way we're going to remember it. Actually, do you have your Dr. Evans book to show how you no. know what, that, what that looks like um, after three years? You know, another book that if you are going to be raising alpacas, you really need to have Dr. Norm Evans' field manual. And he's now into the fourth edition. This was the third edition, but I have it highlighted. I have notes. I have animal names and drug dosages that we've given because I'm not going to remember in two years or five years what I've done, but I can go back to these reference books and, and see what, what worked and what didn't. Uh, Leslie said she just got that book with her animals. It, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the owner's manual for alpacas. You've got to have it. I also have that uh, that book, and I kind of do the same thing. If if I've used any dosages, I put down the weight of what animal it was, what it was for, and what the vet told me, so I can again go back and look at it. You know, and as you get into raising these animals, I do not necessarily call my veterinarian each and every time I administer a medication. I know that it might take a day for my vet to get back to me. And if it's something like an infection and an antibiotic, if I can start it 24 hours earlier, it's better for the animal. So those are things that you develop a comfort level with your veterinarian. And like you said, the dosage and the animal and the weight, and it all helps you refresh your memory the next time you're faced with that situation. I've also, because of my comfort with 
the herd maintenance and the routine toenail trimming and giving shots and dosing alpacas and things like that, because I was a nurse, I like to teach some basic skills to owners, new owners, about giving their own vaccinations and deworming and things like this. I also know of a couple of breeders in our area that call the veterinarian to have them come and administer routine vaccinations, deworming, and to trim toenails. There's nothing wrong with that. that. It gets a little pricey. (laughs) And so if you can learn to be comfortable with it, you're going to save yourself the money and you're going to actually learn more about your animal doing that as well. Yeah, not everyone's comfortable giving a shot. No, it's they're pointy things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully that was a bit helpful. Those forms, take them, pull them apart, put them back together with your information and your farm name, and use what works for you. Get your veterinarian's input. And um, it's the first of the year. You have a couple of days to be able to go out and get your files at the office supply store and, you know, start the new year with with records that are going to help you. And one of the things that we've started just recently to help with farm expenses is we um, have tours for people coming to the ranch. And the money we generate from tours helps pay our our ranch helpers so that we can have somebody give us a break from doing the chores absolutely all day every day you know so that's that's been a nice addition we learned we can't have them do breeding no they no no they don't do breeding they don't do herd maintenance they don't yeah so good questions you guys what else can we help you out with we got a few more minutes Some states require prescriptions for deworming medications and other states do not. That's confusing to me, but um, just find out. I had heard that they're going to start requiring it on a lot of um, antibiotics now. Uh huh. Over the what used to be over the counter antibiotics that you could go to your uh, tractor supply and get. Penicillin G, which is a very broad spectrum antibiotic uh, for cows, sheep, goats, horses, alpacas. Now you're going to require in 23, you're going to require um, a prescription from your veterinarian. And we have found that having that relationship with a veterinarian is so important. And so I try to have my vet come either first appointment of the day so I can have coffee and donuts for them. And he's most likely to be on time. And yeah, most likely to be on time. Or last appointment of the day where I have cocktails and cheese and crackers and just to show them that we really appreciate, Mm -hmm. you know, them taking the time coming to our ranch they're more likely to answer your emergency distress calls when you have a nice relationship rather than you only call them once a year for something. So it's good. Well, even if you do call them once a year, yeah. that's too bad. It's, it's a, a pleasant a pleasant experience. experience yeah. yeah. No, and you're giving uh, your animals that tetanus vax. So that's uh-huh. Pretty much the same stuff that people get with different doses, right? I mean, th- um, very similar. Right. It's mixed with clostridium type C and D as well as tetanus. So there's three different vaccines in that one medication you're giving. Okay. But yes, tetanus okay. is tetanus. So I know that well, I've been reading that they're planning on changing that tetanus vax for humans to be mRNA. Are you aware of any of that? Is it because you'll see those changes also in, because it's the same medicine, right? I am not sure if they're going to be using mRNA with animal veterinary medications or not. 
you know, very frequently they're made at the same manufacturer, but they are marketed just for animals. So I don't know. That's a good question, Donna. I'll have to ask uh, Dr. Wheeler when he's yeah, around they, next time. If they revamp them, because that's the kind of talk about revamping all the vaccines to mRNA. So then that'll go to the animals, which has some implications also. You know, that's that's a real, real possibility. Hadn't I'll have to ask Dr. Wheeler. Mm -hmm. Well, I commend you for doing your research and putting in some time in front of this. In our 20 plus years, we definitely know that the people who do that go into this business with their eyes open. And we have seen some people who lead with their checkbook <laughs> and they hadn't really planned or thought about what they wanted and then they get frustrated. So mm -hmm. it's probably better to think about it and plan and to decide what you want to do or what direction you want to go with your animals. I I live in North Carolina and uh, you might want to look at uh, if your state has a state affiliation group like we have mm -hmm. Cabo and once a year we have our our shows. Mm -hmm. That's how I first got interested in the alpacas was one icy, snowy February day, I went to the Carolina Alpaca Celebration, which is usually a, a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I, the people who own alpacas love to talk to you about their alpacas, give you so mm -hmm. much information. You see the Surreys and the Wakaya, mm -hmm. and, and you can learn, you know, which one you are more prone to uh want to have mm -hmm. and you get lots and lots of information and then I went back the next year too so you know, you don't always have to go to the alpaca association's national show but you can try to go to the state shows and you really get a lot of good information mm -hmm. and a lot of times uh the people that come to the show to show their animals aren't always from your state either they're from other states as well uh, but you can gather a lot of information there. Yeah. No, thank yeah. you. I don't know that our point. state has one, but I think I'd have to go to like a Tennessee or a Georgia or um, another state. But yes, thank you for that. I'll look into it more. If you're uh, you know, looking at certain qualities, um, that actually has gotten simpler than what it was 10 years ago. And when we get into um, genetics and the business side of it, We'll cover and we'll get into more into that, uh, into how that works. But that's a simpler process now than what it was. Well, it was simple then for people that had our knowledge and information that that saw these animals come into the country, followed the bloodlines, you knew which ones were the best producers. It was pretty simple, you know. For uh, but for new people, it was it was a mystery, and mm -hmm. that's not so much the case anymore. Mm -hmm. I had one more question. Oh, yeah. I didn't. Sure. Oh, okay. I I think I asked this before, but I can't remember the answer. Are you DNA sequencing your your alpacas? All of our animals are DNA matched to their parents, but as far as sequencing for specific traits, we're not our markers. We're not there yet. Okay. There are a couple of there are a couple of farms in the United States that are really pioneering this. They are backing it financially. They are doing work like a Cornell uh, vet school is doing some out East. So it, it's happening. Um, it's very exciting because and it's, also expensive. it's very expensive, but well, for it's, certain it's traits. Cheaper. Yeah. It's gotten cheaper, you know, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's still pricey. Mm-hmm. Wasn't no. there one gal in Colorado who was doing it and then she moved to another state, Utah or, or Idaho or something? Well, they're doing that. I mean, there are some markers and things to look at for color, and those are available. Um, that And there's a, a, there's a company in Canada that's been testing. That's not bad. I think it's 40, 
50, 60 dollars a test or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's under a hundred dollars. Um, that's if color is important. Yeah, if 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 color is important to you. We haven't had that talk yet. You know, and from my point of view and the health of the animal, I would like to see them identify those um health related traits so that we could identify is it something we should be aware of something we should not breed for mm -hmm. um that would be my preference but uh i'm not the one providing the money for the testing so yeah yeah well, no. good question Nothing could Dominic, do it I remember all. you're you're the scientist of the group, aren't you? Right. Yeah. You know, so if you could do it in bulk, you know, because you get I, when I have my sequencing done just for my projects, you know, I'll try to do 100 plus samples at a time. So if you can group, you know, you can take your, your blood samples or whatever saliva and you group a bunch of al, bunch of uh, alpaca branches. Right. You can get it probably kind of cheaper. Oh, that would be wonderful. Sounds mm -hmm. like you would have a good project. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll this, yeah. join with you. Yeah. No, we hope to have these Ask Me Anything classes with a little bit of content to start out with, but questions and answers afterwards, like we've done tonight. And we do appreciate yeah your questions. If you have a question that pops into your mind two days from now, shoot us an email and you know we'll get back to you and we'll answer it as best we can. But the programs that we would like to do at least once a month, we'd like to, to have one of these and I'll get better, I promise. Yeah. One or two a month. And um, we'll, we'll get through the basic information. There's so much new things going on with alpacas that it's an exciting time. I wish I were 20 years younger so that we could yeah. know what we know today <laughs> at a younger age. More time. So thank you very much. Good and uh, thank you. Next class that we put on. That'd be great. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Stay safe, people. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.